I'm Justin Johnson, and today I want to tell you about some of my recent work on uh, vision and language. And this one is called Learning Visual Representations from Textual Annotations. And this was done with my PhD student, KD, at the University of Michigan. But before we get to our own work, I want to talk about a little bit more generally about how we learn visual representations in computer vision. So the prevailing way that we do this is via supervised pre-training on ImageNet. And of course, this is something we're all very familiar with. And we'll train this thing up on ImageNet, and then after it's converged, we'll transfer that visual backbone to various downstream tasks, like object detection. And this has been a really successful paradigm for learning really high quality visual features in computer vision over the past five years or so. But the big problem is that this pretext task of supervised classification on ImageNet relies on a lot of human-specified annotation. So in particular, scaling the amount of data that we train on for this pretext task of classification is very, very expensive. Now, the situation is somewhat different in natural language processing. So here, this, this idea of unsupervised pre-training has sort of taken the field by storm over the past two years or so with the advent of the BERT model. So here, what they can do is they can take a lot of unsupervised text that they download from the internet and perform masked language modeling on a bunch of unsupervised text. And this is their pretext task. And then, of course, we can fine tune this large transformer model for many sort of downstream tasks in natural language processing, like question answering, common sense inference, and other sorts of NLP tasks. And now the beautiful part about this unsupervised pre-training in natural language processing is that this pre their pretext task does not require any human labels at all. So we can download as much data as we'd like from the internet and allow us to scale up and up and up the pretext task. And indeed, people have done this. Over the past two years or so, um, various groups have just trained larger and larger and larger transformers on larger and larger data sets of unsupervised text. And now, when computer vision people look at graphs like this, we start to get jealous. And we also want to find out some way that we can also take advantage of this infinitely scalable pretext training task. Fueled a little bit by this BERT envy, computer vision has had several different types of responses to uh, this very successful unsupervised pre-training in NLP. So all of these are different mechanisms that have allowed us to gain some sort of scalable pre-training in computer vision as well. But as we'll see, there are some problems with, with each of these three formulations that I think um, our work on language-based visual pre-training uh, helps to overcome. But to, to understand the benefits of our approach, I wanna talk in a little detail about each of these three mechanisms one by one. So first, with Webly supervised pre-training, the idea is that we'll download a bunch of noisy images and labels from the internet, and we'll learn visual features on this sort of noisy data that we collect from the internet. One of the big canonical examples of this sort of Webly supervised pre-training is the JFT dataset from Google, which consists of about 300 million images uh, annotated with labels from about 18,000 different categories. And in this paper back at ICCB 2017, uh, folks at Google showed that training on larger data in computer vision also uh, gives a lot of benefits on downstream tasks. Another canonical example of Webly supervised pre-training is an uh, Instagram pre-training project from some of my colleagues at Facebook. So here in this paper from ECCB 2018, they showed that they could train on up to 3.5 billion images from Instagram and train a neural network to predict the user-provided hashtags for those Instagram images. And in doing so, they were able to outperform uh, supervised pre-training on ImageNet. But now, the big problem with Webly supervised pre-training is that it is extremely, extremely, extremely data inefficient. And you need to download a whole lot of these weekly supervised images with labels in order to get good results. So as one sort of concrete data point on this aspect, um, if we look at the Instagram pre-training project, for one particular data point on this, we see that training on about 6.6 .6 million ImageNet images gives similar performance on downstream classification as training on, nine, on almost a billion images from Instagram. So that means that about one ImageNet image with an ImageNet label is worth about 142 Instagram images with their labels. And this, uh, this ratio just means that these Webly supervised data, data pre-training setups are extremely data inefficient. So that's the big problem, I think, with Webly supervised pre-training to date. Another mechanism for pre-training in computer vision, which has been very popular in the last year or so, is this idea of self-supervised pre-training. So here, we're going to have a large collection of unlabeled images and somehow learn features directly on a, a large collection of images with no labels whatsoever. 
And now there's a bunch of different papers and approaches for this, but one kind of common paradigm in how many of these self-supervised mechanisms work is the following. So here on the left, we'll start with a bunch of unsupervised images. And then from those unlabeled images, we'll perform a bunch of random image aug augmentations or image transformations, performing different bits of random cropping and flipping and color jittering and blurring. Then from each of these random crops, we'll pass them through a backbone CNN network that will extract some features for each of, the, each of these crops. And then finally, the, ch the, the learning signal is that patches from the same source image should somehow give similar visual features from this network and patches from different source images should give uh, dissimilar visual features. And now there's, there's, a many, there's many different concrete ways that this has been instantiated, but this is kind of the general flavor of learning mechanism that many of these, that many of these approaches rely on. Um, and these self-supervised approaches have gotten to be very performant and given really good, strong empirical results on ImageNet in the past one year or so. There's sort of way too many methods here for me to go into any of them in detail, but the general trend is that they, we can now learn visual representations on unlabeled ImageNet images that perform almost as well on downstream tasks as using the ImageNet labels. I think that even despite the success of these self-supervised learning approaches, there's a couple aspects of these methods that I find somewhat unappealing, that I think we can do better. So one problem is that there's no semantics in the learning objective. Um, the learning objective in these things is usually to just push visual representations from the same image together and pull apart visual representations that come from different images. What this means is that there's no learning signal in here that pulls together the visual representations of visually dissimilar images. As a concrete example, on the left here, these two images are both dogs. One is sort of a, a picture of a black dog's head. The other is sort of a full body picture of this Pomeranian. And these two images look very visually dissimilar um, because the sort of low level image statistics of these images are very different. And with a self-supervised learning approach, there's basically no learning signal that pushes these two dog images to have similar representations. In fact, they get pushed apart in many cases because uh, they come from dissim visually dissimilar images. So this is, this is a problem, I think, with self-supervised learning approaches, is that they don't, they don't rope in any notion of image semantics. Another kind of weird aspect of these self-supervised learning approaches is that learning from unlabeled images on their own, I think, might be too hard of a problem. And it's making the problem more challenging than it needs to be. Um, and what I mean by that is that in practice, label images are not unlabeled. From any place that we're going to download unlabeled images, they probably also have some kind of metadata, some kind of other information around those images that we should be leveraging in order to learn visual representations. So I think it's a little bit of an unnatural problem, actually, to try to force our models to learn features solely from a, an uncurated, unlabeled set of images. I think it just might be a, an ill-posed problem. These are the two big problems that I have with self-supervised pre-training methods in computer vision. So the kind of third mechanism for, that I want to talk about for learning visual representations has been the notion of multimodal transformers. So here what we're going to do is download a whole bunch of images and a whole bunch of text and then learn some kind of multimodal model that embeds images and text into some joint feature space. And in doing so, we can then uh, transfer this model to downstream vision plus language applications. So there's been a whole bunch of a whole bunch of multimodal transformer approaches proposed in the literature over the past year or so. So I don't want to get into too many of them in detail. But as a kind of general flavor of how they work, they'll first extract regions from the images, extract tokens from the text, and then pass this this set of image regions and text tokens into one big unified transformer model. Um, that will then perform some kind of masked language modeling objective inspired by BERT. And then after learning this joint vision language multimodal transformer, this, this yellow block, they'll then transfer it to a bunch of downstream vision plus language tasks like image captioning or visual question answering. So there's been a whole bunch of very similar models for multimodal transformers. And in general, they give very strong results for vision plus language tasks like image captioning, VQA, grounding, or retrieval. But if you think about the training pipeline of what these models are actually doing, there's something kind of unsettling. Well, there, there are basically three components to the model. One is the visual backbone, which is going to um, extract visual features. The second is the textual backbone, shown here in green, which will, which will process text. And the third is the multimodal joint vision plus language transformer module, um, which is shown here in orange. 
And now the training pipe, there's a sort of common training pipeline to all of these multimodal transformer methods. So what they do is they first train the visual backbone for classification on image genetics. Then they take the model from one and uh, plug it into faster RCNN and use that to train an object, an object detection model on the visual genome data set. And then after that, they'll sort of set that visual model aside and then go pre-train a BERT model that does a sort of textual understanding on a whole bunch of unlabeled text data. And then they'll sort of take the, the resulting object detector from step two, the resulting BERT model from step three, and combine them together into this joint image language joint transformer model and fine tune that thing on the conceptual captions data set, which gives us a whole bunch of images and text that have been downloaded from the internet. And then finally, they'll take that joint model and fine tune it for some downstream vision plus language task. And now the kind of unsettling part to me about this approach is that it relies on visual features that were ultimately learned via supervised pre-training on ImageNet and visual genome. And even worse, the CNN is often frozen after step two. So in fact, the visual features in the visual backbone are not trained in many cases at all in response to the textual supervision in downstream parts of the training pipeline. So what I like about these models is that they sort of learn vision and language joint features using a whole bunch of internet data. But what I don't like about these models is that they rely on supervised pre-training to learn the visual features. So, that's what, so that gives us these, these three approaches in computer vision that we have today for training, uh, for training uh, visual representations in a scalable way to try to hopefully get, push us towards the success in NLP. It, now that we've sort of set forth these existing approaches and seen, how, and seen the problems in these approaches, I want to talk about our approach. So our approach is that we will learn visual features directly from language annotations using no sort of supervised pre-training. And then after we learn this one single pre-training vision plus language step, then we transfer the CNN to downstream visual recognition tasks. And what's critical about this is that it puts the, visual, the, the vision as actually downstream from the multimodal vision plus language pre-training, which is something that no other methods are doing right now. Our method is called Vertex, uh, learning visual representations from textual annotations. And the pipeline is actually very simple and straightforward. So we start from an image, we pass the image through a visual backbone, which is typically a ResNet 50 in most of our experiments. Um, we apply a linear projection layer to that convolutional feature map to get some kind of visual features. And then once we apply this linear projection, then we pass these visual features to a textual head. And this textual head is going to uh, have two uh, independent streams that are trying to predict a caption from the input image. So the first will be a forward model that tries to predict the caption one word at a time, left to right. And we have a backward branch, which is trying to predict the caption right to left. Um, both of these are modeled using autoregressive transformers with weights that are unshared, except for the token embeddings at the beginning and end of the model. And these transformers are just bog standard transformers that have no sort of fancy stuff. They perform a mask multi-headed attention over the input textual sequence that is generated so far. Uh, they perform decoder attention over the linear features, over the visual features. Um, and then they have sort of layer normalization, feed forward networks, and we stack all these things up in a sort of standard transformer setup. So this mechanism is actually very simple. Um, and what we do is we take this CNN plus transformer, train it from scratch on the COCO data set to predict captions from images. Then we transfer the CNN to downstream visual recognition tasks. So you might ask, why should we use language to learn visual representations? One good reason, I think, is semantic density. And what do I mean by that? I mean that a, a piece of language captures much more semantic information than the learning signals that are used in other approaches to learn visual features. And we've sort of seen this already. So self-supervised learning often relies on contrastive approaches that basically just try to match representations across different random augmentations of an image. So there's no notion of semantics here or categories here. In image classification, which is something like our, our, our old friend ImageNet pre-training, there is one associated category label to each image. And we, we get a little bit of semantic information per image, but sort of only one category label of semantics per training image. Now for something like multi-label classification, maybe we get multiple labels per image, um, or maybe something like object detection, we get multiple labels per image, as well as maybe their, their spatial locations. So these are more semantically dense pre-training tasks that we could use to learn visual features. 
Now, in contrast, something like image captioning is extremely semantically dense in the sense that a single caption tells us a lot of useful, rich semantic information about an image. So, for example, in the top, if we look at this, this, picture, of a, this uh, picture of a cat in the upper right, uh, the caption might say something like an orange and white cat near a plate and a white cake. And that tells us about multiple object instances, the, the cake and the cat and the plate. It tells us about the attributes of those instances, like the, that the cat is uh, orange and white, that the cake is white. And it also tells us about relationships among those instances, like the orange and, cat, or the orange and white cat is near the, white, uh, near the plate and the cake. And my hope here is that because each, each caption gives us so much rich semantic information about the image, that hopefully learning from captions ought to be more data efficient than other mechanisms of, visual, of learning visual features. And hopefully will allow us to learn really good visual features using fewer images and fewer annotations, which is somewhat in contrast to the data inefficiency that we saw with uh, Webly supervised approaches to learning features. So we can see that this approach of learning visual features from language annotations actually overcomes the shortcomings of all three of these prior approaches to uh, learning visual features. It's extremely data efficient in contrast to Webly supervised pre-training due to the semantic density of language annotations. Um, of course, it uses semantic information unlike self-supervised pre-training. And unlike multimodal transformers, we are actually learning our visual features from language annotations, thus putting vision downstream from vision and language for the first time. So this, even though this model is conceptually simple, there actually are a couple tricky bits you need to get it to work. Um, so one is on the optimization side. Um, so rather than using straightforward SGD plus momentum, we actually found it helped a bit if we used the look ahead optimizer that was proposed um, by Zhang et al. at last year's NeurIPS. The second really important bit was about learning rates. So it turns out that CNNs and transformers actually want different learning rates to learn. So to get this model to optimize properly, we had to set different learning rates for the CNN and the transformer. The third is you have to train for a pretty long time. As I said, we train our model from scratch on Coco, which has about 118,000 images and uh, about five captions per image. And to get this model to converge, we had to train it for about 500,000 iterations with a batch size of 256 images, which comes out to about 1,000, more than 1,000 epochs over the images and more than 200 epochs over the captions. So that's actually a pretty long training schedule. Um, we, were, we were able to speed this up a little bit by using mixed precision training through NVIDIA Apex, and that gave us somewhere between a 1.6 to a little more than a 2x speed up, depending on the model. And then overall, the training time is about three days on a, on a server with eight 2080 TIs. So now on to our results. So the first thing that we need to talk about are the image captioning results, because basically our model is doing end-to-end -end image captioning on Coco, so we felt obligated to at least see how well it does at this task of captioning. And it does okay, but it doesn't do great. Um, so our results are around like n a little more than 90 CIDR, which would have been state-of-the-art in about 2016, but now uh, state-of-the-art in captioning is about 130. So we're doing reasonably, but not quite state-of-the-art on captioning. Although I'd like to point out that captioning metrics are not very meaningful in my opinion, because humans only get about 85 CIDR and all of our models are above the human performance. So I, I think that captioning metrics are just kind of noisy these days. Um, the, other the, the one interesting piece that I do want to point out here is that deeper and wider transformers tend to improve on this captioning task, even though this wasn't the task we really cared about. And our captioning results are uh, pretty reasonable. We generate sort of reasonable captions that look similar to other captioning methods, and we can generate reasonable attention maps over images that are very similar to what other sort of captioning me mechanisms do. But now, we didn't really care about image captioning. It was just our pretext task. Um, what we really care about is whether image captioning can, al can allow us to learn visual features that can be transferred to the downstream visual recognition tasks efficiently. So here is our first key result on uh, actually can visual features be learned from language annotations. So the setup here is that we first pre-train the model on, uh, on Coco captions, and then we transfer the CNN and train a linear classifier on top of the CNN features to perform linear classification on uh, the, the Pascal VOC classification data set. And I told you we were interested in the data efficiency of our approach. So we do this with varying amounts of, of uh, annotated images using various baselines. So the first is standard ImageNet supervised pre-training. Um, if, if we sort of do supervised classification pre-training on various random subsets of ImageNet of different sizes, we can see that generally, you know, training on more images gives you better performance at this uh, linear classification task on VOC. 
We also compared with recent approaches to self-supervised learning on ImageNet, uh, like Moco and, and, and uh, Perl, which perform almost as good as supervised pre-training on all of ImageNet. And now here's the really cool result, is our model, Vertex, trained on just about 118,000 images with five captions per image, actually performs much better than ImageNet pre-training at, at many different scales of data on which you could train. We also tried training Vertex not with, one, not with all five captions per image, but just with one randomly selected caption per image. And we still see that this gives very strong scalability in terms of visual features as a function of how many images you train on. And finally, um, there's a bit of mismatch between these results. Um, our, our models are training on Cocoa images, and ImageNet is training on ImageNet images. So, that's a little, so there's a little bit of a mismatch here. To, to try to overcome this, we also tried training Moco, which is one of these state-of-the-art self-supervised methods on Cocoa images, and that performs quite a bit worse. Now, there are a bunch of interesting takeaways to see from this experiment. The first is that, indeed, learning visual features from language annotations is extremely data efficient. So for the same number of training images, um, using captions is much better than using uh, classification labels from ImageNet. Um, the second is that using training on all of Cocoa, which is about 118,000 images, actually gives us better performance on VOC classification than training on, than pre-training on all 1.2 million uh, supervised images, classification images on ImageNet. Um, and I thought this was shocking, because basically we're training on 10 times fewer images, but we're outperforming uh, supervised ImageNet pre-training. The, uh, the third sort of interesting bit to note here is that um, if you have a budget not on images, but on captions, then you're actually better off having one caption for more images than you are having five captions for a fewer, fewer number of images. So this is our first big killer result, is that learning visual features from language works and works better than ImageNet supervised pre-training, even when we use 10 times fewer annotated images. Um, we also did a similar experiment for linear classification on ImageNet. And note that this experiment is extremely unfair to our model, because the baseline of supervised ImageNet pre-training is the same as the downstream task of classification on ImageNet. Um, whereas our model is performing a pretext task, a captioning on Coco, which is very different from the pretext ta from the downstream task of linear classification on ImageNet. But even despite this unfairness, we see that under the same number of annotated images, we perform almost as well as directly learning visual features on the downstream task of ImageNet classification. Um, so I thought this was, again, a really amazing result that showcases the power and the data efficiency of learning visual representations from language. Um, now, uh, on Coco, there's, there's sort of many different ways you might imagine learning visual representations from the annotations provided by Coco. So to demonstrate that language, and, and in particular bidirectional captioning, is the right pretext task for learning from language and learning on Coco, we wanted to ablate a, a, a couple other ways that you might use to learn visual representations from Coco annotations. So the, the first result is um, our, bi -cap our bidirectional captioning, which we use in most of our experiments. The second is using only unidirectional captioning. The third is uh, token classification. So here, rather than modeling the language as a sequence of words, instead we perform multi-label classification over the tokens in the captions. All of these three baselines use the Cocoa caption annotations. We also considered baselines that use the object, the object instance annotations on Cocoa. So we considered multi-label multi classification, where you try to classify which objects are present using the object detection labels from Cocoa. And we also considered uh, instance segmentation pre-training, pre where you train mask RCNN from scratch to perform uh, instance segmentation on Coco, and then pull out the backbone and transfer it to downstream tasks. So we can see that across all of these different mechanisms for using uh, data on pre-training approaches on Coco, um, using bidirectional captioning that makes use of the, the, the linear linguistic sequential structure of the language actually performs a lot better than other approaches. What, and in particular, um, this bi-captioning gives really large gains on Im downstream ImageNet classification. We tried ablating the architecture. Um, we show that actually using larger visual backbones sort of works in our pre-training approach. Most of our experiments use ResNet 50, but we can also use a wide ResNet or a ResNet 101. Now, the interesting bit is that we actually, show, we actually showed that um, if you use a wider transformer, it also improves the results. And this is a little bit non-intuitive because the transformer, recall, we're going to throw it away after pre-training. Um, and we'll, we'll end up only using the CNN for our downstream classification tasks. So we were a little bit surprised to find that wider transformers help learn better visual features. 
My intuition here is that maybe a more powerful transformer lets the transformer deal with any sort of linguistic parts of the model and pushes the brunt of the visual modeling uh, onto the visual backbone. And then similarly, we also found that deeper transformers also uh, improve performance on downstream tasks. In addition to linear classification on VOC and ImageNet, we also considered um, object detection as a downstream task using faster RCNN. Um, and in this setting, we compared to a sort of learning from scratch to do uh, detection directly on VOC. Um, we compared to various approaches that perform ImageNet pre-training, either supervised or self-supervised, MOCO and Perl. Um, and we also con compared against a running MOCO, self-supervised approach on COCO. You can also break this up and, and think about ImageNet is classification pre-training, uh, MOCO and Perl are, are self-supervised pre-training that work only on images, and our vertex model is using language-based pre-training. And across all these results, we see that our model, our, our vertex model, is performing about the same on this downstream task as any method on ImageNet pre-training, um, even though we're using about 10x fewer labeled images. Again, showcasing the data efficiency of our approach. In addition to object detection on VOC, we also considered instance segmentation on COCO. And here the story is much the same. Um, even though our model is trained on about 10x fewer images, we're able to match or exceed the performance of uh, ImageNet pre-trained models. Now, what I thought was really exciting and maybe my favorite result of all was um, on this task of fine-grained few shot detection on the Elvis dataset. So Elvis is this dataset where you need to recognize not 80 categories as in COCO, but you need to recognize about 1,200 different, cate uh, different categories and detect them in images. Um, and this is sort of, there's sort of a long tail of categories that you need to recognize. And many of the categories might have very few instances in the training data. And on this uh, Elvis detection task, Vertex actually outperforms all, all other methods that we compared against, including uh, random initialization trained directly for uh, Elvis classification, as well as ImageNet pre-training on all 1.2 million ImageNet images, as well as self-supervised pre-training on either ImageNet or, uh, or COCO. And my intuition here is that language annotations have maybe do a better job of covering the sort of long tail of stuff that might occur in images. And as a result, language-based annotations might actually do better um, when trying to recognize the long tail of objects. Um, I'd also like to briefly point out that a couple pieces of concurrent work that use ideas very similar to ours. So um, there's another paper at this ECCV which has a very similar approach to ours. Um, the basic differences are that they use an image conditional masked language model rather than an autoregressive captioning objective like we do. One big difference is that they use a pre-trained BERT model to extract uh, language features. We learn all of the language transformer stuff in addition sort of jointly with the rest of the model, and we don't rely on any external text data. Um, and in general, they, give pre they have pretty similar results to us on VOC and ImageNet classification, um, but they don't show any results on other downstream tasks like detection or, or, or long tail recognition like we do. And now another really cool piece of concurrent work is um, this other paper from Stroud et al. And here the idea is, is sort of similar, except they're doing this on video. They also rely on pre-trained BERT, um, but they're very large scale. They, they train on up to 70 million YouTube videos, and they get pretty good results on downstream video recognition tasks. So I'd also like to point out that the code uh, docs and models for our Vertex model are all online. Um, and I, I really have to congratulate uh, KD for just this amazing engineering job that he did on this project. Uh, I think this was probably one of the best engineered projects that I've ever met, uh, released source code with. And uh, KD deserves all of the recognition for this. And one of my favorite parts about our code release is that you can actually download our best vertex model that was pre-trained on language using just a single line of code, thanks to Torch Hub, using no installation and no cloning and no nothing. Um, you can use our model using just a single line of code. So for any, any application that you're trying to work on where you would previously have used ImageNet supervision or ImageNet pre-training, we really strongly encourage you to just try dropping in the Vertex model and see whether language-based pre-training could be helpful for your downstream task. So in summary, we showed that we can actually learn high-quality visual features directly from language annotations in a very data-efficient manner that learns from very few images. Um, and, we, and in particular, we showed that we can train CNN plus transformer models from scratch to perform captioning on COCO, and that this matches or exceeds image, supervised ImageNet pre-training on a whole host of standard downstream visual recognition tasks, even though we train with 10x fewer images. 
And now I think the really exciting piece of future work here is the question of how well would this approach scale up to larger web scale data? So thanks for paying attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions about this or anything else during the Q&A session that we have later. Thank you.